Welcome everyone to this week's transmission of Ascend TV, Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm your co-host Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burning. And, and today our guest is Kathy Farmer, autism advocate and co-founder of Autism Angels. But before we get into our program, Will, what's with your shirt today? Funny you, sh funny you should ask that. This week's, this week's shirt it, week is my giant shirt. I'm I'm wearing I'm I'm wearing it to promote I'm promoting giant today I'm promoting giant season start starts up in April and some of you may have heard that the giants have have gone are going back to playing in person again and they they they've even drafted a new team can you tell us about some of your activities in the autism field yeah well first of all thank you so much for letting me be here amongst all of you it's a it's a true honor um, so I've been involved in autism probably before most of you were diagnosed with autism. Um, my brother Michael was the first person at the Cleveland Clinic diagnosed with autism in the late 60s. Uh, at that point in time, it was a ratio of one in 10,000 people was autistic at that point in time at least. And it was much more of a narrow spectrum than it is today. Um, and so um, my mother and father had an interesting experience uh, because the only reason we knew that Michael might be autistic, first of all, we really didn't know what that was, was that somebody at the church had said, have you heard of autism? So just imagine so long ago, and that my mother was like, no. And then he said, there's someone at the Cleveland Clinic you should see. So the doctor did diagnose Michael at the Cleveland Clinic, which now has a great program, but back then, it wasn't, there was this notion that the mothers were the cause of autism and that my mother was cold. And for her, it was confusing because I'm one of six kids and I'm the third. The fourth person, Michael, is the person who was diagnosed at the Cleveland Clinic. And so my mother was confused because there was blame on her when she had three other children and we were, uh, we were not autistic, so she was con confused. I haven't done anything differently, but, but they didn't know very much back then. Okay, so fast forward to the 80s when my brother Tom was diagnosed with autism or Asperger's back then. And, um, you know, for him it was, it was a, different, a different dance uh, because he doesn't have the intellectual disabilities that my brother Michael has. So Michael, so here's what's interesting. When Michael was diagnosed with autism, uh, he was deemed as high functioning. And I know it's not a term that everyone appreciates, the high functioning term, but it was used back then. Because he was verbal, that was the only reason he was told he was high functioning, was because he was verbal, because back then most autistic people were nonverbal. And today it's very different, the spectrum is so different today. Uh, the majority of people on the spectrum diagnosed do not have a, uh, an intellectual disability and probably some of you are in that category. Uh, so it's just, it's just really interesting to see how it's evolved and the whole measurement of the population is complicated. But I, I wanted to say, so that was my first involvement, was being a little girl growing up with my brothers. Um, and my parents were profound advocates because they had two sons on the spectrum when there wasn't that many people on the spectrum, right? So they stepped up and did advocation. And so um, that included the Autism Society. That included, they started group homes in New Jersey. Uh, and, and then they joined boards to support. Uh, this was in New Jersey. They also, um, they, they just did a lot of work. And that then uh, was a guidance for us as we were growing up to be advocates as well and to be involved. Uh, I studied computer science and math, and my father wanted me to use that to help the autism community. And he had started, uh, my dad was one of the founders of the Organization for Autism Research, which is out of Washington, D.C., which supports people on the spectrum. There's a lot of resources there. And um, we can put the website up at the end, right? Um, uh, but it's researchautism.org. And there's lots of resources there for people on the spectrum, for people doing research, for families with an early diagnosis. It's a wonderful source uh, of uh, a value for the community. Um, anyway, um, so um, they were, my father was also part of New Jersey Advocates for Disability. And so he did lots of things. Um, 
So then when he told me I should really consider it, I knew I wanted to do that, but I was busy raising my children. And so I waited until I could really afford the time to help. And so I had been doing some investing with small startups uh, starting in the late 2000s. And I made an investment in the autism space and I met Dr. Maureen Dunn, who's my co-founder of the Autism Angel Group. Um, we both had the similar philosophy of people on the spectrum and the neurodiverse in that we, um, we believe that uh, there should be private equity for startups with good solutions for the neurodiverse and neurodiverse founders should also have access to some money to have a start a business. So we had similar philosophies and we decided to start this angel investment group which none had existed up to that point. There's individual angel investors, and I can talk about what that is mm -hmm. in a moment, but um, there was no specific group. So we, we started that the summer of 2020, July of 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, and we haven't looked back. Uh, and it's been wonderful. We've interviewed many startups. We've invested in uh, quite a few. And uh, you know we're 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 seeing some exits. We're seeing some good returns. But most importantly, it's not about the money if we make any money or not. It's about does the solution benefit the community. So that's been really great. And um, and I do a lot of other work, and we can talk about that with some of your other questions. But but basically, that's to summarize how I got involved in the community and how it's important to me to help the community and my brothers. Let's start with Autism Angels. Can you tell us more about that? What businesses do you invest in? So we invest in solutions that help the autism and the neurodiverse community. So that could be something like <clears throat> uh, an Internet of Things device on your wrist that helps notify people around you if you're having a meltdown yourself, that a meltdown may be coming or a family member that a meltdown is in the process of happening. That would be kind of an alert um, solution that, that people are interested in. Uh, there's another, there's other solutions that are of value, like, um, have you guys heard of Florio? No. no. So Florio is a, a virtual reality startup that helps with, um, therapy using VR. Now VR is complicated because you're wearing a VR tool over your eyes and not everyone on the spectrum can handle that uh, device because it's too overly stimulating. For example, my brother Michael, we tried not that, that software, but we tried the VR tool on his head and he, and he loves music and so it was a concert you know, the content in the VR was a live concert or appeared to be a live concert. And he just couldn't handle it. He, his ears turned red. He like, take it off, take it off. So, so, so that's, that's an interesting challenge, but apparently 80% of the population can handle VR. I don't know if that's, that stat is true, but you know. So that has been really great because it helps, especially during the pandemic, it's a solution that helps, you know, you'd learn your colors, learn your shapes when you're really young. And as you get older, there's more advanced treatments with VR. If you have a phobia, for example, with spaces or you have a phobia with certain things, it helps you break down those challenges. And so um, the founder, a lot of times the founders of these companies are parents or siblings of people on the spectrum or themselves. So as I said earlier, I invest in neurodiverse founders as well. And so people find me because I'm, uh, you know, autism, an autism angel investor is kind of a unique title. And so if you're autistic and you're, you've got the wherewithal to, to do the searches and you know exactly what your business plan is to create a solution to help the community, you might reach out to me, for example. And I've had people do that and it's been great. And I, I meet startups all different ways, but the ones that reach out to me cold on LinkedIn, for example, I have a, a warm place in my heart for because wow. they're they're just being really brave and going and you know re reach out into someone cold. Hey, 
are you open to listening to my startup and are you open to mentoring someone on the spectrum? And my answer typically is yes. You know, that, that's something that I enjoy doing. What is the process for applying for funds? Great question, Will. Uh, on our website, autismangelsgroup.com, there, when you land on the homepage and you scroll down, there's two boxes, one for investors and one for entrepreneurs. If you want to apply for funds, you would click on the entrepreneurs box, and then you would populate the form, which would include your name, your LinkedIn profile, a summary of your startup, and who your co-founders are. When you apply, you should be making sure you're ready to apply. So you have some preliminary work you need to do. You have to have a business plan. You have to have done customer discovery, meaning you have to put your business plan together. Let's say it's a solution for microphones for the autistic, making it up just for to walk through this story, okay? And so you have to interview a bunch of people that you are autistic who would use a microphone to see what their requirements are to make sure you had a comprehensive view of what is needed. You have to look at all the different kinds of microphones that are out in the industry to make sure you know what you need to create so you can start thinking about if it's a hardware that you need to deliver or is it just an app that you're going to create. So you have to think of lots of things about the community but do you have the right people on the team? So if Stacy and Will are the co-founders of the autism microphone company, you need to make sure you guys have the time to commit, you both care about the product, and you put the plan together of how you're gonna make this work. There are people in the industry to help who wanna, who could help you with their mentors that are available. Um, but one of the things we consider in investing is the team. And we like to see someone on the spectrum. And in fact, of the companies I've invested in, um, almost 15% of the companies have a neuro neurodiverse founder. And I'm very proud of that. Of almost 29% or 30% of the companies I advise with advisory shares have a neurodiverse uh, founder. So even a broader group, because I invest not just in this space, but also in mental health and in digital health and some other environmental things that help the world. So um, I look at the team, we look at the market. Now the market in general in this space of neurodiverse is the volume of people who need the tools. So in the case of the example of the microphone, it would be those that use microphone is how big the market is, okay? That number. And does it have a social impact? So what is the value? And, um, and in fact, they, they even have a day that they honor. So I'm really glad that both you guys talked about um, uh, neurodiversity and, and, and United Nations. So uh, back in 2019, Dr. Lawrence Fung, you guys are all familiar yes. with yeah. Dr. Lawrence Fung. Yeah, he's Fung, on our board. Right, well, perfect. So he spoke at the United Nations oh, on the wow. World Autism Days to give you a perspective. And he explained to all the nations what autism was and sort of the work they're doing at the okay. Stanford Neurodiversity Project that you guys are probably familiar with. Um, yeah. In the United Nations, they created what are called sustainable, sustainable development goals, okay? Mm -hmm. And those are things that impact, that help help the world, as you heard the definition of the United Nations. And so for my our Autism Angels group, we look at those goals and we call out the ones that are relevant for the neurodiverse community. And those are... So these are things you think about when you're putting a business plan together. What is the social impact it has, not just for the neurodiverse community, but beyond. So if you look at good health and well-being, for example, um, the prevalence of anxiety and depression, you want to reduce that. You want to have access to essential health services, and we're going to talk about that in a moment, hopefully. Learn, uh, your quality education, decent work and economic growth, right? Industry, innovation, and infrastructure, financial support, uh, reducing inequities, human rights in the world, and uh, partnerships for goals, accessing solutions for all. So those are the sort of goals from the UN that we align with our Autism Angel investments. So we look at the team, we look at the market, we look at the social impact, which touches on those goals I just talked about. 
what is the differentiator? So what is unique about your solution you're bringing in for money? It, are you the only autistic microphone that exists? Is that, mm -hmm. do you have special technology knowledge there? So it's something to think about. And lastly, what is your traction? So how have you validated that this is gonna work? How many people have you tested it on? How many letters of intent from buyers do you have? You know, how many people have you queried to know how to sell? Those are things you have to think about when you wanna put a business plan together and come to us for investment. Hopefully that helps. Thank you very much, Kathy. This has been very, very informative. And, and going from there, uh, could you let our viewers know uh, how many uh, businesses uh, your organization has funded at this point? We have funded through the Autism Angels around 22 startups. We've heard almost 300 startups since the summer of 2020. Mm -hmm. So not everyone gets invested in, as you can see, it's a less than 10%. Um, but we, we consider all the things I mentioned earlier. And, um, and sometimes it's only one investor of the 35 we have, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's six investors, and we collect. We each investor will wire the money individually to the founder, and then create a contract mm -hmm. around the shares, uh, the investment shares. So that's sort of a, the normal process. Okay. Judging by your name, uh, the name of Autism Angels, I would assume that it's a group of angel investors as opposed to a venture capital fund. Is that correct? Excellent question. Yeah, that is a correct statement. However, what we do is quite interesting. We, we cater to angel investors who have a certain net worth. Either they are employed and make a certain salary. There's IRS rules mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. But we also invite all of the neurodiversity venture capital funds to our pitch events because we are we don't pay ourselves we um, the money we get for our at for uh, our group goes to we call neurodiverse entrepreneurship we have a program that gives micro grants out to people who are neurodiverse who would like to start a business small grants between three and five thousand with mm -hmm. some mentoring um, so we invite the venture capitalist firms. There's about 12 firms around the country that invest in this space. We also invite researchers. And the reason we do that is so that when people in labs at universities come up with great solutions to help mm -hmm. the community, the last thing we want to do is have that great solution sitting on a shelf and not going and becoming commercial to help the community. So we invite the it researchers to learn and listen to what it takes to commercialize something into the workplace or into the mm -hmm. commercialized uh, access and and what it takes and so a lot of times a researcher will go I want to meet that founder or and you know vice versa and so we just think it's important because the community is so unique that there's this extra connection so let me just clarify that we don't give grants out for the initial investment but that actually is uh, private equity and investment for a portion of their company, a very small portion, but we do give micro grants out for the neurodiverse. And so I'm glad you asked a little bit mm -hmm. more about that. You could typically get anywhere between three and five thousand dollars, and it's through a program called ndentrepreneurship.org. But we'll put the the website on the at the end of the show. You'll you'll get the copy of the mm -hmm. URL. And you can apply, and you we the grants are supported by Dr. Dunn and I, and we mentor the teams, and we help them get a little uh, boost up to start their business, to start the journey of their entrepreneurship um, process, which is uh, not for the uh, not for the weak, but it is wonderful and fun. Excellent. One last thing, along going back earlier regarding the investments as opposed to uh, the micro grants, you mentioned that there's a very involved process uh, for vetting, um, and I imagine what I'm about to describe happens fairly frequently. But what do you, what does your organization uh, do typically when they run across an in, uh, an individual or a group of people? They clearly have a marketable idea, but they also clearly would be unable to create a team or even come up with a business plan. How do you deal with mm. the situation? Excellent like question. Thank you for asking that. So um, I get all different people on the spectrum. Let's talk about 
neurodiverse founders for, for this answer, if that's if that makes sense. Um, and some of them um, come to me and they have their act together. They've been in the startup world as a developer or they've been a founder before and it failed. And that's a good thing. You actually want to have a startup that has failed because you learn so much more from failure than you do from success. Yeah. So from success, you're just like, oh, just a happy path, just carry on. But with its failure, you're thinking about all the things that went wrong and what you could do differently and better next time. And I'm a big fan of success by failure experiences. So I, what I do is when you apply for the investment money, I do a 30 minute interview with everybody who applies. Every single person gets 30 minutes of my time. And I do that assessment. Who's the team? And they get to choose how they want that 30 minutes. You can have a formal pitch, pitch to me with your deck, your, your presentation. You could have um, an informal conversation with me. Whatever, and you could have just yourself or you could have your whole team. It's whatever you want. And my assessments that happen then are, do these people have either the wherewithal themselves or the team around them, right, that can um, deliver a solution. Mm -hmm. I look at that and I look at, do they know enough about what they're delivering? So they may care about something. I know I'm the silly example of the autistic microphone, but it may be because someone has um, a volume issue Mm -hmm. And nothing that is on the market helps them. And they have unique, a very unique thing. I also have to recognize on behalf of the other investors, if it's too small of a solution, and only, uh, so what do we have? How many people are neurodiverse on the planet? So neurodiverse hits 20 to 40% of the population. That's true. When you look at neurodiversity and all the different types of conditions that fall within that. So there's, it's, it's got a wide slack range mm -hmm. of 20% of the population, right? Um, and so the microphone may only support a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the population. Mm -hmm. Then it may not be, it may be something that has to be a lifestyle solution and not investment in private equity. You still apply for the micro grant because those are, a lot of those are for lifestyle solutions. So lifestyle means you're not going after, you know, to get in the stock market or something with your solution, you know, go public. Uh, a lifestyle is more just it's just gonna make you comfortable in your life it's a it's a job it's not necessarily a business that will grow and employ a bunch of people okay um, and so you have to just as an investor and as the person who's leading mm -hmm. the discovery of whether or not somebody goes forward they have you have to really look at what they're bringing to the table and is it enough and it's investable and um, but again it's an if it's that's the challenge if you look at like money for drugs that only help a percentage of a percentage of the percentage of the population yeah. is super hard to get money no different with with investment dollars for startups yeah okay. and one last thing uh, along those lines this is very very informative and very interesting to our viewers um, how often do you run across uh, individuals they're clearly part of our community but their product or service would not be uh, Often toward the community. Yeah. Oh, you mean oh, they come to me with a solution that's just for everybody, as yes. opposed to that's neurodiverse. So that's fine. Yes. In other words, say you ran into an Elon Musk or a, you know, uh, or a uh, Bill Gates, who, you know, clearly have a viable thing there, but there it's not for our community, and they're clearly on there. Yeah, so we totally invest in neurodiverse founders, even if the solution is not for the neurodiverse. So absolutely. Although those guys don't need my money, I need their money. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Gates back in seventy five. No, he's neurodiverse. Money. Yeah. I mean, I raised a neurodiverse. Uh, one of my sons has ADHD, so I get the dance very well. And now I'd like to talk about a book that's been getting quite a lot of attention lately. Prince Harry's memoir, Spare. Now you might be wondering, what is the autism connection with this? Prince Harry is not autistic. True, but his father, who is now the King of England, could be autistic. You could certainly understand his, a lot of his behavior and his character makes a lot more sense. The man has been called everything from a nutter to worse. But when you put 
and in the context of he could be autistic, then he makes a lot, a lot, a lot more sense. And to give just one example, um, of course, one of the most heartbreaking scenes of the book is when Prince Charles, he was Prince Charles back in 1997, was telling his children that their mother was killed overnight in a car crash, which would be a horribly traumatic experience for any family, even without the tabloids breathing down your neck 24 seven. And, but the way Harry describes it, Charles just walks into the room and informs his son of what happened like he's a journalist reporting on the death of the prime minister and not the mother of his own children. And then he just walks out with uh, very little emotionality and doesn't show any affection toward his son. And you wonder, how could he be like that? What kind of father would do that? But if you put it in the context of the man could be autistic, then you understand it a lot better, don't you? And a few pages later, Harry describes his father telling him about um, and Prince Charles, when he was at school, he was bullied mercilessly. And isn't it funny how the psychologists with their PhDs, they can't identify which children are autistic. But playground bullies can do it with laser point accuracy. Of course, Prince Charles had the misfortune of being born in 1948, when the rate of diagnosis was close to zero out of 10,000, because it didn't exist back then. If he'd been born half a century later, Things might have been different. And so, yes, I recommend this book because it gives quite a lot of psychological insight, not just into Prince Harry, who is not autistic, but also his father, the King of England, who could be. Thank you. Thank you very much again, Jennifer. In our final segment, we'll now hear from Stacy Kennedy, our cultural correspondent. Hello, everybody. Um, February 18th. Saturday. That is a Saturday. Um, yes, it's actually, I was just told that um, we're going to have our next Ascend hike in Chrissy Field, and I would go to the Ascend website and check that out. This is news for me, which, but I love hikes. I'd be glad to go to it. So Chrissy Field starting, I'm guessing, around 10 a.m. So um, transportation, if you drive, take Muni or so. It's a very, uh, well, it's complicated like area, but once you're there and walking, it's beautiful. So... Um, February 21st, Tuesday, is a network for autistic professionals via Zoom, the third Tuesday of every month uh, at noon, hosted by, I will do my best on this, but um, Ava, Ava Labrie Consulting for Neurodivergent People to Learn Network and then to Share. Uh, I would go to the evolabri.com. <laughs> I will spell it out just in case. Capital E V O L I B R I. So, and RSVP for the virtual meeting on that day. And one more thing, one more thing. I'm surprised I didn't have it in the February 27th, Monday, is a Nero Queer happy hour at 12 Fair Avenue, 94110 San Francisco, starting at 7 p.m. There will be a neurodivergent, particularly for the LGBTQIA and folk. Get a safe, mellow place to meet each other and ND aware healthcare providers, which is the Zoranovic. Mm chiropractic for a lightly structured evening to get to know each other, an icebreaker, there's going to be food and drinks and sponsor conversations and connections with other ND folk. Eventbrite, you could check that out there too. Thank you. Thanks again as always, Stacy. Well folks, uh, that's our program uh, for this time. I'm your co-host Keith Halperin. I'm Will Burdick. Stacy Kennedy. And Jennifer Brooks. Kathy Farmer. Until next time, uh, we're Ascend TV, live on the autism spectrum. Stay well.